morning. I want to thank uh, the organization for inviting me um, and supporting the uh, chance to come here and speak with you. I'm a, a pediatric urologist. Uh, my focus is pediatric neurourology. So those of you that are adult interested and only adults and don't care about children, you can take a break because I'm only interested in children. My job uh, was to uh, do a couple things this morning. One was to, uh, I was asked to talk a little bit about urodynamics. I was asked to talk about our initial um, encounter with uh, TM patients uh, and to talk to you a little bit about a program that we've been doing for a long time called bladder and bowel stimulation. Um, so I'm going to try to do all that in a very short period of time and hopefully I will succeed. Um, the maturation of the urinary system, uh, a mature bladder cycle, uh, in other words what all of us hope for is uh, that the, the bladder will fill and I'd like you to focus on this desire to void because desire means sensation and I will talk about sensation over and over again because to me sensation is the most important part of the urinary tract. Uh, then there is postponement, uh, the initiation of the sphincter to relax, the external sphincter and the internal sphincter and then there for the bladder to contract and then the maintenance of uh, sphincter relaxation and bladder contracture. Now, I am archaic. I don't use a computer, so how do I make the slides go? Hmm? Great. What I like to say is that I'm a plumber, uh, and, uh, you know, so uh, computers and I haven't met eye to eye yet. Um, and I'm also get kind of nervous when I see the wires of the, of the body rather than the pipes of the body, but I, I have focused a little bit at the, of, on, on this in my lifetime. Um, but basically, uh, to keep it about as simple as we can, um, the important thing that I would like to start with is that the bladder fills. And again, what we get is that once the bladder starts to fill uh, and it gets to the full stage, then we get a, uh, a signal, which is the sensory side of things, which starts the whole process. And the way the bladder fills is there has to be inhibition of the, uh, or accommodation of the smooth muscle of the bladder, and there needs to be tightening of the outlet so that the bladder can fill appropriately. And then what happens is that the sensory signal starts the bladder to contract because it sends a signal up to the micturition center, which is in our midbrain, that then sends a motor signal back down the cord and then causes the bladder contract. And the bladder contract contraction has to occur simultaneously with uh, external sphincter relaxation. If this does not occur, then we have inappropriate uh, emptying and inappropriate pressures building up in the bladder, which then ultimately affect uh, the way the kidneys empty and the way the kidneys work. So the first goal was to talk about pediatric urodynamics. Uh, who do we do urodynamics on? Which patients need urodynamics? Uh, we have the largest myelomeningocele center in, in the world at Children's Memorial Hospital in Chicago, um, and therefore my experience is quite extensive with the myelomeningocele patient, but we have a large population also of other patients with neurological uh, or neuro neurological changes in their bladder, and that is how our interest with uh, TM came about. Um, so we have newborns with my, uh, myelomeningocele and spinal cord injury, we have neurourologic changes in patients with neurogenic bladder, which would include the TM patients, uh, patients with other lesions that cause problems with the bladder and perforate anus, uh, obstructive lesions such as posterior urethral valves, and complex patients who have uh, inability to uh, empty their bladder for unknown reasons, which sometimes we need to clarify more carefully, and so we do urodynamics. The patient evaluation is not any different than uh, any other evaluation. In other words, we need to get a good history and a physical, uh, and then we do what I say is a urologist neural, neural exam. This is not a thorough neurologic uh, examination. We leave that for the neurologist, but we are interested in uh, saddle anesthesia, the anal reflex, the bubble cavernosal reflex, and sensation. And again, as you'll notice, most of these things have to do, once again, with sensation, because again, to me, sensation is the critical factor in the way things go. We then get a urinary flow rate, and you can't read this, but it's a post-void uh, 
uh, residual urine that we obtain either through uh, ultrasound, preferably, or with a catheter, uh, urinalysis, and then finally, in some cases, urodynamic testing. Not everyone gets urodynamics. Uh, we would like to, uh, the purpose of the tests of urodynamic studies is to confirm a diagnosis and to evaluate symptoms. If you come in with a group of symptoms, sometimes we can uh, figure out what's wrong with you without doing urodynamics, but uh, sometimes we need to confirm the diagnosis with urodynamic studies. We will suggest effective therapy based on these studies, and then we will hopefully be able to give some degree of prognosis in terms of what we think is going to happen down the road. The problem is, particularly in children, is that their urinary tract and their neurourological system is in a developmental phase. So uh, we may n see you at two years of age uh, or a month of age, but we certainly are not going to be able to predict what you're going to be like when you are five, six, seven, or eight years of age, which is the time that people would like to try to have urinary continence. So in terms of prognosis, we do our best, but at an early age, it's somewhat difficult. Uh, what information is needed from our urodynamic testing uh, in terms of the bladder and the urethra? In the bladder, we are trying to determine what is the capacity or your capacity, the sensation that you have, the contractility, and the accommodation, which is the most really important thing of all. In other words, how well will the bladder store and how will it store uh, relative to its pressure and increasing volume? And then with the urethra, we want to understand outflow resistance, at rest and when the, the child is voiding, and is there voluntary urinary control? So how do we uh, uh, get to this? Uh, if we're looking at the bladder, we're looking at accommodation and contractility, the ability of the bladder to hold urine at a low pressure, and how well does it contract? The way to do that is through a systematogram, what I call a bladder pressure study. And for the urethra, we want to figure out outflow resistance. And the way we figure that out is through a urethral pressure profile, which we don't do a lot of, and sphincter electromyography, which we do do a lot of. And then we do a uroflow with post-void residual urines. Again, hopefully we can accomplish that with uh, an ultrasound rather than with a catheterization. So when we look at the systemetrogram, what are we looking at? We're looking at bladder capacity, the tone, the sensation, the ability of the bladder to contract, the ability to store urine uh, at a low pressure, and whether the bladder is of normal activity, too active, uh, and is there any voluntary control of the bladder. So when we do urodynamics, we do what I call non-invasive or pediatric urodynamics. That is different than adult urodynamics. And very often we will get referrals from adult centers, and we will look at the studies that they have done and I don't want to say anything against our adult urodynamicists, but they're usually inappropriate. And it's because they don't understand the way that children uh, react to urodynamics. They don't understand filling. They often fill children much too fast. And so we tend to like to do our own urodynamics when people are referred to us from outside institutions. We try to do a non-invasive as much as possible. We hydrate the child either with uh, sodas or water or whatever prior to coming in. But if necessary, we will start an IV so that we can hydrate the patient completely. We do Lasix. We give Lasix uh, a diuretic, if necessary, to get a child to void multiple times while they're in the laboratory. We use surface pad electrodes like EKG pads when possible, although sometimes we are uh, forced or need to uh, or want to use needle electrodes. Uh, we do a flow and an EMG. Then we do a CMG. And very, very, very rarely do we ever need to uh, put the child to sleep and do cystoscopy. When we're doing Euroflows, we're looking for appropriate volumes. In a 4 to 13-year-old, we need a volume of at least 100 cc's. In children and uh, adolescents and young adults, we're looking at volumes that should be in the range of about 200 cc's. And we're looking at these kinds of rates uh, for these age ranges. And I, I would like, uh, I forgot to say at the, at the start, I wasn't totally sure that I needed a syllabus. I apologize. I did make one, um, and if you want copies of these slides, um, they uh, would be available by email, I guess, to the coordinator out front. Um, so you could get them, or you could just say, that was interesting, and toss all this in the garbage in the video, all right? This is a child. It looks kind of daunting, but I must say that uh, this is a lot, lot better than we used to do with needles uh, everywhere. 
Uh, we just put these little EKG pads on the, on the abdomen to, to check for abdominal straining. These are our ground leads. And then we have some perineal leads, which you can't quite see, that are underneath. We try to put children on an appropriate size toilet. Uh, this looks like his legs are dangling. We try not to do that. Uh, we try to get the feet planted on a floor or some kind of platform so that they feel quite stable and that they're not uh, feeling like they're going to fall off the, the uh, toilet. And taking care of these kinds of things as well as, of course, privacy issues are very important in getting uh, good studies, a nice warm atmosphere, cartoons going on, things that are uh, distracting for a child, uh, taking the extra time, particularly for infants. These are the kind of things that we have to do for uh, children that may or may not necessarily be done for adults. So we're looking for uh, the pathophysiology. What are we looking for? For bladder activity, uh, basically, again, uh, looking at simple things. Does the bladder, is the bladder have any activity, uh, diminished activity, too much activity, or is completely unstable in terms of uh, contractions that are occurring that we really don't expect and don't want? Uh, and then we look at the pelvic floor activity. And again, that comes from either our uh, EKG leads, uh, paste on leads, or needle electrodes. Is the pelvic floor overactive, inappropriately overactive, or is there any activity whatsoever? Uh, and we're looking at smooth muscle activity and then sensory loss from the bladder and or urethra. Why do we care? Well, this was uh, one of the early, early studies that Stu Bauer did uh, at Boston Children's. And uh, what it really showed, and it was in myelodysplasia in MM patients, but it, it uh, translates to all neurogenic bladder disease, that if you have dysinergia, in other words, if the bladder is contracting and the external sphincter is contracting at the same time, uh, then the pressure in the bladder will be uh, elevated to a level that is unhealthy. And in those patients that had dysinergia, the deterioration of kidney function uh, and bladder and then subsequently kidney function was very, very high. Whereas when you had uh, patients who had synergy, in other words, their sphincter or their outlet relaxed appropriately with bladder contraction, those patients did quite well. Or even in the patients where they had very little outlet uh, resistance or activity, those patients also did well. So the ones that we are really nervous about are these guys over here. And those are the ones that urodynamics sometimes can tell us when something's wrong. And that's going to lead to the second part of my, of my talk, which has to do with the TM patient. So this is what we don't want. This is a bad bladder. And it is uh, trabeculated. It's thicker than expected. Uh, and the pressure in the bladder is higher than we want. And the reason for that is that when this bladder contracts, the outlet is contracting. And it is starting to elevate the pressure in this bladder, which is going to be translated to the kidneys. And eventually, we're going to see kidney dysfunction one way or another. We need to change this somehow, some way. So when we do think about that, and don't focus on incontinence, but focus on really accommodation, what we're trying to do is maintain renal function. We're trying to help the patient to become dry if possible, and if possible, establish a normal voiding pattern or an emptying pattern, whether that be voiding or catheterizing or whatever, we need to somehow be able to have the bladder accommodate urine and accommodate at an increasing volume of urine at a low intravesical pressure. That is absolutely essential. Whatever it takes to do that, that's what we've got to do. What we would like is to accommodate at an increasing volume with a closed bladder outlet so that, that the child stays dry and that there's an absence of detrusor instability. In other words, we'd like the bladder, as I say, the bladder to be happy. We would like the bladder to fill and be happy during that filling time and empty, happy with no outlet resistance. So we look at, and this was a study that was done in Canada, we look at um, the pressure in the bladder and the magic number which was described by Ed McGuire at, uh, in Ann Arbor um, and uh, what we have held as gospel, although I think 40, the pressure in the bladder at 40 is probably a little bit too high. I think it's somewhere, it ought to be somewhere between 20 and 30. But let's say that we take the classic statement that a bladder pressure of 40 centimeters of water is the, is the gold standard. What we need to figure out is how long can this bladder hold until it reaches 40. If it looks like this, that's great. That means that this bladder is holding 300, 350, 400 cc's, and it doesn't reach 40 until it holds that much. That would be great. The bladder that looks like this is bad. This holds a very small amount before it reaches the magic number of 40, 
and somehow we have to shift this curve to this one. And how we do that is the challenge. So we want renal health, social continence, of course. And the way to get that in a lot of people is to do with clean intermittent catheterization combined with pharmacotherapy. And I will tell you that of the uh, 1,500 kids that we're following with myelodysplasia at Children's, approximately 80% of them are on a clean intermittent cath program and approximately, or sorry, 85% are on clean intermittent cath and approximately 80% of them are on uh, pharmacotherapy. So we tend to use a lot of clean intermittent cath and pharmacotherapy for this population uh, and we have pretty good results uh, with that. We have been probably one of the slower, considering the number of patients we follow, the, probably the slowest group to get into bladder augmentation procedures and bladder neck procedures. And the reason for that is that I think part of it has been my insistence on this part of the program and my insistence to work with the neurosurgeons to figure out ways of working with the nerves. Because obviously if you can trick the nerves to make them work more properly, you'll trick the bladder. And if you can trick the bladder, then you don't need to do surgical procedures. Uh, we have started to increase our level of uh, surgical intervention, as some of our other procedures have not always panned out. But my goal is this and not this. And if we can do this, then we're much better off in my, from my point of view. So the advantages of intermittent cath, I don't need to tell this group. You already know all that. Um, but the thing that I would like to stress, particularly to parents, is the return of spontaneous detrusor activity. Most people who start on intermittent catheterization think that they're, because you're on intermittent cath, you're putting the bladder to sleep and it's never going to work again. That's absolutely wrong. When you're on intermittent cath, you're making the bladder as healthy as it can be, and if there is going to be spontaneous detrusor activity, uh, it will come even with a program of clean intermittent catheterization. So this is what we want. This is a happy bladder and it's filling at a low pressure uh, and whether it is able to contract on its own and empty completely or whether we need to catheterize it to make it empty completely, we have converted that ugly looking bladder to this kind of bladder and that's what we have to do. So let me now move back to the TM patient and go back to some, some aspects of it. And, and I want to again focus on this desire to void, which is what I started with, was sensation. Okay, so we're going to talk about sensation uh, to a certain extent here. So we're looking at the afferent pathways, and these afferent pathways originate in the S2 through 4 dorsal root ganglia. Uh, these are myelinated and unmyelinated, which we call the unmyelinated fibers, we call C fibers. And these afferents go via the pelvic nerve to the dorsal horn in the uh, cord. And unfortunately, we haven't figured out the decoding of these uh, signals. In other words, we don't know the difference. We can't figure out the difference between heat and cold and stretch or anything. We just know that there are sensory signals that we need to pay attention to. These afferent uh, input go to the supraspinal center, uh, sites, which is the micturition center uh, in the midbrain, and uh, they go via the spinal thalamic tract. So the afferent pathways are the ones that we're paying attention to here. And the reason that we're paying attention to them is because of a program that we started quite a long time ago at uh, Children's called bladder stimulation. So this is the next part of the talk that I'm going to get into. Bladder stimulation, just to give uh, a complete overview, was started in Hungary by Katona and uh, Bereni. And uh, in um, 1975, uh, Dr. Bereni came to Children's and uh, talked to me about bladder stimulation and I told her she was nuts and that the, the whole thing was completely crazy and don't waste my time. And she was pretty forceful and uh, dragged me into a, a room the size of uh, that closet and it was hotter than anything and she showed me about 7,000 slides and by the time I was done I said, let me out of here, okay, I'll try it on one patient, get away from me. And uh, it was really a lucky thing that I did because I think it totally changed uh, my life and it totally changed uh, the lives, I think, of some patients. So uh, Ingrid Richards, uh, the nurse that's been working with me for a long time and is actually really the expert on this, I just get invited places, but she really is the one that knows stuff. Uh, Ingrid uh, and I published our first paper in 1986. 
There have been others who have tried bladder stimulation, and I'll talk about them in, 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 in passing. Uh, some of them have not as had as good as results as we have had, um, and they have published their papers, and, and that's terrific. We believe that we have answers as to why their papers did not come out as well, um, but um, we did, to answer the critics, we ended up doing a, a multi-center, about 12-center study on bladder stimulation, and it turned out that they confirmed that our data was uh, correct. Uh, so we, we felt good about what we had started in 86 and are still doing today. So bladder stimulation, the main goals are improved bladder sensation, there's that word again, induce controlled voiding, and improve bladder health, uh, making a happy bladder, which Ingrid hates when I say that. The, uh, this is the stimulator we use. It uh, is presently still made for us uh, in uh, Austria. Uh, we have just bought some new ones from Italy, but we cannot find an American manufacturer that uh, we can interest in making us, so we still import all our stimulators. This is a very, very old slide, well, probably one of the original ones in our old Eurodynamic lab, and this is an old stimulator that we had, uh, one of our original ones. But the children come in, and uh, it's a pretty okay atmosphere with TVs going and movies and um, pretty cheery uh, setting as far as we can uh, make it. And uh, they, the children will come in, and I'll show you the, the whole package in just one second. But this is the parameters of stimulation. Uh, what we do is we give what we call a package, then an interval, then another package, and we can vary all of these uh, stimulation uh, parameters with the stimulator that we have, and this has been one of the problems in getting a, a stimulator made in the, in the United States. Nobody really wants to spend the money to, to, to uh, get these exact parameters for us. But what we do is, a, and I hope you, it's very small, but basically what happens is a child comes in, gets a bladder pressure study, a CMG, we run the children or we stimulate the children in an outpatient setting for four weeks and then we do a, uh, which the stimulation session takes an hour and a half, and then uh, we do another CMG at the end of four weeks. Generally, there's a six months rest, rest period. We bring the kids back, and we generally run you for another week or two. As an initial bladder contraction, stronger and longer contractions, spontaneous voiding if possible, and then the inhibition of voiding. There's no sense getting a child to, to urinate if they cannot inhibit it. That would be bad, so we have to be able to inhibit it. Sensation is the key. So what did we accomplish with the bladder and its contractility ability? Here's pretreatment. These bladders are not contracting at all. Um, and we moved on, and this was normal. This is pretreatment. This is not contracting. This is very weak contraction. This is not contracting. What did we get? We moved certainly those who were contracting into a much more, a higher percentage of patients. But again, this was not a total goal of ours. And bladder emptying, you can see that most of these patients were on clean intermittent catheterization when they came to us, abdominal straining. Now you can see that a larger number of them are normal voiding, uh, and we have moved a lot of the patients with abdominal straining into the normal voiding pattern. Here's a patient, I will say this is a myelomeningocele patient, but it's such a typical slide that I, I, and I've used it, and this was from this was one of our first patients uh, quite a few years ago. But basically, in session two, you can see this is bladder pressure, no real bladder pressure here. So he gets no detrusor contraction, no bladder contraction. And here by session seven, you can see that he has a very excellent bladder contraction. And this child has now gone on to stop intermittent cath, voiding on his own, and is dry. I will show you another patient with TM who has similar looking uh, slide. So bladder stimulation improves bladder capacity and compliance, makes the bladder happy. In the majority of patients, more than 80% of patients who come to us, we make their bladders happy. That doesn't mean that they void. That just means we make their bladders happy. That means they can accommodate urine at a low pressure. And in patients where bladder capacity does not increase, the, their bladder capacity was near normal to begin with, so we couldn't really make them a lot, lot better. And bladder stimulation appears to be best suited for bladders with decreased capacity and compliance. Those bad bladders, those are the ones we want. If you come to me with a bad bladder, I can make it better, and that's what I like. But don't come to me thinking that I'm going to make you urinate. That's not probably going to happen. 
Uh, it is reproducible based on our uh, multi-center study, and it is safe. It has never hurt anyone in anyone that has ever come to us. We've never hurt you, which is nice. Um, so we looked at sensation and said, well, transverse myelitis patients, and I must say that we have one of our initial stimulators uh, in the room today who kind of pushed us in the direction of paying attention to transverse myelitis. But we um, looked at the idea that if transverse myelitis affects sensation, maybe with bladder stimulation we can make a difference here because if we can increase sensation, then maybe we'll make the bladder better somehow. So we started thinking maybe bladder stim would work. So what we s knew that transverse myelitis had a significant, this was misspelled, neurourologic impact, and urodynamic findings in pediatric uh, TM patients, there was hardly any studies, if any, we could find, and that pediatric urodynamics could detect at-risk patients. So that was our goal when we started looking at these kids. We knew that urodynamic evaluation of the child with transverse myelitis needed to be done and that we ought to pay attention to it that we knew that intravesical transurethral bladder stimulation improved sensation of filling and emptying in 80% of the patients, so we wondered would that translate into the TM patient. So we wanted to determine if improved sensation that occurs with bladder stim would benefit the TM patient. That was the whole goal. We have a very few number of patients. Uh, we have, uh, and again, these are primarily um, six months to 18 years, and most of them are much, much younger than the 18 years. We took five patients who had no stimulation and took four and we stimulated them to see what would happen. What we found is that eight out of the nine patients had uninhibited bladder contractions. In other words, those bad contractions that we don't want. And six out of the eight of them had unsafe pressures. They were greater than 60 centimeters of water. And remember, 40 is the magic number. So with urodynamics, we found patients who were at risk. So that made it say, you ought to do urodynamics in TM patients because you're going to find, in pediatric TM patients because you're going to find some who are unsafe, walking around with unsafe bladders, and that's not good. Four out of the eight of them did not leak, and that's bad because if you don't leak uh, at certain points, that suggests that the bladder and the sphincter are not working together. We found in bladder capacity that five had normal capacities, which was nice. Two were larger than expected per age, and two were smaller than expected per age. And these, again, are ones that we worry about. On the bladder stimulation patients, there's only four, so it's not a huge, huge number. In terms of bladder pressure, two stayed the same after bladder stim, one increased, and one decreased and became more safe. So that's good. But all four developed increased sensation, which to me is very important. We didn't have sensation in the ones before we started, and once we finished bladder stim, they all developed increased sensation. And what happened to their bladders? Well, all are on intermittent cath, but they have increasing ability to void. And again, I don't want to focus on this. I'm happy that it's happening, but I'm more impressed by the fact that I have been able to develop increased sensation. And remember what I said, those patients who developed increased sensation for, with bladder stim all did better. Did better from bladder happiness, accommodation, some may be void. I don't care as long as I can make their sensation better. Those who did not get bladder stimulation, their sensation stayed about the same. They didn't, some had some, some didn't, but they didn't get any bit better and they were all on intermittent cath and that's the way they were going to stay. Here is a uh, patient who has really no good detrusor contraction here at all. As the sessions went along, you can see that some of these bladder contractions are good ones, and even though there is some abdominal straining here, uh, these contractions are better, are better than these, uh, s these uh, external sphincter or abdominal straining activity. And eventually, this is what this bladder has done. And this, although it's not a powerful contraction, it is certainly enough to empty the bladder. And that's reasonably good for me. Finally, something I don't want to talk about, but Ingrid insisted that I bring the bowel stim stuff, so I will just talk about it. And that is, pay, we use bowel stimulation. We can do bowel stim at the same time that we do bladder stim, slightly different catheter, which I'll show you. Patients have to be on a, off all bowel pro protocols, uh, mineral oil, enemas, DD, and Dadu. Outpatient procedure, 30 minutes daily sessions, five days weekly, 
benefits assessed after three weeks, we continue or we stop. Um, I, I meant to mention to you, when do we stop patients? We stop patients, we tell patients don't come back, although we're not usually that cruel. We tell you not to come back for bladder or bowel stim if you don't get any sensation. And I think that's appropriate, but sometimes we are talked into having people come more. But in bowel stim, we're pretty, we're pretty, um, we, we're, we stick to it. So if you don't get anything a after about three weeks, then we tell you to stop. What we're looking for is decreased number of daily stools, developing or increased sensation, develop or improve the ability to hold stool, and observe significant changes. This is the catheter. It fits into the rectum. It's got this little stimulation thing here. And uh, it's a much lower, we give much less um, stimulation package than we do with bladder stim. It increases sphincter activity. It promotes effective evacuation. It eliminates the need for suppositories or enemas. It increases sensation and decreases the accident. Uh, number of accidents. Total number of patients, these are not TM patients. Uh, s there are a few in here, but that's not the total number of our patients that are TM. I don't want to give you a false reading here. Eleven were successful. Decreased number of stools, increased sensation, decreased accidents. S Fourteen were moderately successful, slight increase in the stools, some improvement in sensation, and three we had no success and no change. So, bottom line, I think urodynamics are important uh, in certain number of patients. I think it can be helpful in the TM pediatric patient. I think they ought to be done. I think we need to pay more attention to the pediatric patient in terms of urodynamics. I think in a select number of patients, not everyone, I think we can benefit some with bladder stimulation and bowel stimulation. And um, I appreciate your attention and your time and asking me to come. Thank you.